Chapter 5 Ambassadors of Reconciliation 2 Corinthians 5 verse 1 For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God, and house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. If our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, our fleshly body is decaying, and it will dissolve in death or at the rapture. A building of God, our resurrected body is one that is eternal that will not decay, and it will live eternally in the heavens. 2 Corinthians 5 verses 2-3 For in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house which is from heaven, if so, be that being clothed we shall not be found naked. For in this we groan, in this earthly house, our bodies, we ache and groan and so much more as this tabernacle, body, ages. Our house which is from heaven, this mortal body will put on immortality. We shall not be found naked, we will not go into eternity disembodied nor as an angel, but God has a body for us that is eternal that can survive in the presence of a holy God and move about in the heavens. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 4 For we that are in this tabernacle do groan, being burdened, not for that we would be unclothed, but clothed upon, that mortality might be swallowed up of life. Mortality might be swallowed up of life. Our body naturally wants to get its permanent dwelling place that will not have the limits of this present one. This temporary tabernacle, physical body, will be swallowed up by our permanent house, resurrected body. Paul taught about it in his epistles to the Romans where he referred to our body's transformation as our adoption, example, the redemption of our body, Romans 8 verse 23. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 5 Now he that hath wrought us for the selfsame thing is God, who also hath given unto us the earnest of the Spirit. Not only has he given us a new body, but God who is so gracious has also given us something right now that is a guarantee to us that he will also give unto us a new body. God hath wrought or fashioned for us the selfsame thing that Christ himself has which is a glorious body like unto his according to Philippians 3 verse 21. That is the earnest of the Spirit. The word earnest means a down payment. We have received a down payment on the Spirit, and while we have all of Him, He does not yet have. All of us. That will happen when the change happens at death, or the rapture, and then we will follow God fully without the continual resistance of the flesh pulling us toward evil. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 6 Therefore we are always confident, knowing that, whilst we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. At home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. To be alive in this sin-cursed body means we cannot be in the presence of the Lord. 2 Corinthians 5 verses 7 to 8 For we walk by faith, not by sight. We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Both death and the rapture will accomplish the same thing, the acquisition of the new body not made with hands but an eternal one in the heavens. Death means we will immediately be with the Lord in heaven. The rapture also places all of us immediately in the presence of the Lord. The Judgment Seat of Christ 2 Corinthians 5 verses 9 to 10 Wherefore we labor, that, whether present or absent, we may be accepted of him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that every one may receive the things done in his body, according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Wherefore we labor, we labor for the Lord because we want to be accepted by the Lord which has absolutely nothing to do with earning our salvation. He has done all that is necessary to earn our salvation. We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. All believers in the body of Christ for the last 2000 years will be judged at the same time. That every one may receive the things done in his body. This is speaking about the things that everyone has done in Christ's body, the church. Colossians 1 verse 24 Who now rejoice in my sufferings for you, and fill up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh for his body's sake, which is the church. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 11 Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men, but we are made manifest unto God, and I trust also are made manifest in your consciences. The terror of the Lord, the terror of the Lord is not going to be felt by a believer at the judgment seat of Christ, 
but it will be experienced for eternity by the one who dies having never accepted Christ. Therefore, we should all be about persuading men, mankind, to be reconciled to God. The average believer is not accepted by God in his service and will not experience an easy time at the judgment seat of Christ as he or she is called to give in. Account for their lack of service to the one who died for them. Sin or salvation will not be the subject for us at the judgment seat of Christ, but it will be our service after we have been saved. People will be judged for their work as to what sort it was and if it was profitable. People who have promoted whatever was popular instead of recognizing Paul's ministry and patterning ours after his will suffer great loss on that day. 2 Corinthians 5 verses 12 to 13 For we commend not ourselves again unto you, but give you occasion to glory on our behalf, that ye may have somewhat to answer them which glory in appearance, and not in heart. For whether we be beside ourselves, it is to God, or whether we be sober, it is for your cause. Paul was not bragging of his spirituality, but rather he told them that they and he would all stand before God at the judgment seat and that he was warning them that who put on a good show in front of others would one day be humbled. Paul said that God is the judge whether or not he or they were sincere and that he was only trying to get them to consider what lies ahead for those who continued in their disobedience. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 14 For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge, that if one died for all, then we're all dead. The love of Christ, Christ's love should constrain us into his service. Our love for Christ and what he did will never compare to his love for us. Romans 8 verse 35 Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword. Ephesians 3 verse 19 And to know the love of Christ, which passeth knowledge, that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. If one died for all then all, then we're all dead, Christ died our death for us. So, we should live his life through us. In Romans 6 verse 23 it says the wages of sin is death. Christ had no sin, yet he died for me a sinner. So, I died with Christ, but only the sinless Christ could pay the sinner's wages because he owed nothing. Death had no hold on Christ so he could resurrection himself from the dead. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 15 And that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. Too many people today who name the name of Christ and who have received God's grace have kept it to themselves and preachers are partially to blame for not crying out to their congregations to get busy serving the Lord. They live unto themselves and not unto Christ who died for them. Live unto God it has eternal rewards. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 16 Wherefore henceforth know we no man after the flesh, yet, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth know we him no more. Henceforth know we no man after the flesh, we no longer know Christ according to his earthly ministry, but we know him according to his ascended ministry, which was revealed to the Apostle Paul. Since he died for us, we as believers are all dead to the flesh, and we should walk in the Spirit, not fulfilling the lusts of the flesh. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 17 Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature, old things are passed away, behold, all things are become new. In Christ, those who are in the body of Christ by believing the gospel. 1 Corinthians 15 verses 1 to 4 A new creature the one new man, no longer a Jew or a Gentile. Old things are passed away, the old man. Have you quit sinning since you have gotten saved? No. Why not? Paul is not talking about you quitting all of your old sinful habits and getting new godly ones. He's talking about who you were before you were saved, the old man, and who you are now, a new creature. You are a saint. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 18 And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. All things are of God, this is speaking of the same all things that have become new in the new creature found in verse 17 above. Who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, God reconciled us to himself while we were his enemies. 
the ministry of reconciliation, you, a new creature, have been given a ministry to do in Christ's body, the church, and that is to reconcile the lost to Christ. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 19 to wit, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. To wit, to know. Genesis 24 verse 21, And the man wondering at her held his peace, to wit whether the Lord had made his journey prosperous or not. How is the one new man possible, you may ask? God was in Christ, and he reconciled both Jew and Gentile unto himself by the cross. The Word of Reconciliation, 1 Corinthians 15 verses 1 to 4. For those of us who have put our trust in God's Son for our salvation God is no longer imputing our trespasses unto us in fact our sins were imputed unto Christ. We have been reconciled to Him and He has given the word of reconciliation to the apostle of the Gentiles to give to us to in turn give to the world to reconcile them to God. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 20 Now then we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. Ambassadors for Christ, workers for Christ. 2 Corinthians 6 verse 1 We then, as workers together with him, beseech you also that ye receive not the grace of God in vain. God did beseech you by us, because of what we have received we are to go out into this world as his ambassadors and spread the message that Christ Jesus was in the world reconciling people unto God. Jesus took our sin, and we got his righteousness. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 21 For he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. He hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, God made Christ to be sin for us. Christ was sinless. Hebrews 4 verse 15 For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Paul ends verse 20 by beseeching the lost there in the church that are hearing this epistle read before the church to be reconciled to God or to be saved. He continues his plea for the lost in chapter 6 that we might be made the righteousness of God in him, because we are in Christ's body, we have the righteousness of Christ imputed to us by faith. Chapter 6 The Ministers of God 2 Corinthians 6 verse 1 We then, as workers together with him, beseech you also that ye receive not the grace of God in vain. As workers together with God, laborers with Christ in the ministry of reconciliation mentioned in the previous chapter. Also 1 Corinthians 3 verse 9. Receive not the grace of God in vain, what a waste to hear of the wonderful grace of Jesus and not do anything with it, laboring for Him. It is an empty selfish life lived when it is not lived for God. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 3 and 10. Paul had clearly explained the grace of Christ to such a point that any lost person had heard enough to be saved even though the letter up to this point had been mainly written to the saved in Corinth. Paul knew there were lost people in their midst. Some were first-time visitors, others had been there a few weeks, but some were deceiving themselves and sat in the congregation there week after week and were not saved. 2 Corinthians 6 verse 2, For he saith, I have heard thee in a time accepted, and in the day of salvation have I succored thee. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Paul uses a prophecy for Israel, Isaiah 49 verse 8, as a practical application for us today in the age of grace. Isaiah 49 verse 8 Thus saith the Lord, In an acceptable time have I heard thee, and in a day of salvation have I helped thee, and I will preserve thee, and give thee for a covenant of the people, to establish the earth, to cause to inherit the desolate heritages. 2 Corinthians 6 verses 3 to 4 Giving no offense in anything, that the ministry be not blamed, but in all things approving ourselves as the ministers of God, in much patience, in afflictions, in necessities, in distresses. In all things approving ourselves as the ministers of God, key word is in any situation an ambassador finds themselves in God has a way to endure it, and it is endured by the things mentioned in the next three verses. 
Paul was beat many times and imprisoned for his faith, this would have been enough to get the average minister to have quit. But the Apostle Paul, he wasn't in it for the glory he was in the ministry because the love of Christ constrained him. 2 Corinthians 6 verses 6 to 7 by pureness, by knowledge, by longsuffering, by kindness, by the Holy Ghost, by love unfeigned, by the word of truth, by the power of God, by the armor of righteousness on the right hand and on the left. By, while there were the setbacks mentioned in verses 4 and 5 the blessings that come from God far outweighed them. When you see God do something that only He could do whether it was through His Word or through something miraculous you can't help but get excited about serving God. 2 Corinthians 6 verses 8 to 10 By honor and dishonor, by evil report and good report, as deceivers, and yet true, as unknown, and yet well known, as dying, and behold, we live, as chastened, and not killed, as sorrowful, yet always rejoicing, as poor, yet making many rich, as having nothing, and yet possessing all things. As, the world sees us ambassadors as deceivers, but God knows we are telling the truth. As unknown, no bodies, but we will be well known in eternity while the famous of yesterday will be long forgotten, as dying, but we possess eternal life, as chastened by the, but we alive in Christ. As sorrowful, yet always rejoicing because of those who we bring to. Christ and are going to be with him, as poor, yet possessing all things as joint heirs with Christ. Romans 8 verse 17 And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. 2 Corinthians 8 verse 9 For ye know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that, though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that ye through his poverty might be rich. 2 Corinthians 6 verses 11 to 13 O ye Corinthians, our mouth is open unto you, our heart is enlarged. Ye are not straightened in us, but ye are straightened in your own bowels. Now for a recompense in the same, I speak as unto my children, be also enlarged. Our mouth is open unto you, Paul and his companions held nothing back from the Corinthians in declaring to them the truth. Ye are not straightened in us, they were not in a poor spiritual condition because of Paul, it was because of their own willingness to listen to these false teachers who had come in and deceived them. Be also enlarged, Paul wanted them to be enlarged, rich, spiritually through the word of God. 2 Corinthians 6 verse 14 Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers, for what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers, saved and lost people are going in opposite directions, and we are not to unite with the lost to accomplish the things of God. 1 Corinthians 5 verses 9 to 11 I wrote unto you in an epistle not to company with fornicators, yet not altogether with the fornicators of this world, or with the covetous, or extortioners, or with idolaters, for then must ye needs go out of the world. But now I have written unto you not to keep company, if any man that is called a brother be a fornicator, or covetous, or an idolater, or a railer, or a drunkard, or an extortioner, with such an one know not to eat. 2 Corinthians 6 verse 15 And what concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? Belial, Satan or wickedness? Deuteronomy 13 verse 13 Certain men, the children of Belial, are gone out from among you, and have withdrawn the inhabitants of their city, saying, Let us go and serve other gods, which ye have not known. Infidel, an unbeliever, pagan, or idolater. 2 Corinthians 6 verse 16 And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God, as God hath said, I will dwell in them, and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Exodus 29 verse 45 And I will dwell among the children of Israel, and will be their God. Zechariah 13 verse 9 And I will bring the third part through the fire, and will refine them as silver is refined, and will try them as gold is tried. They shall call on my name, and I will hear them. I will say, It is my people, and they shall say, The Lord is my God. Ye are the temple of the living God. 
1 Corinthians 3 verses 16 to 17 Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy, for the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. 2 Corinthians 6 verses 17 to 18 Wherefore come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. Isaiah 52 verses 7 to 12 How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him that bringeth good tidings, that publisheth peace, that bringeth good tidings of good, that publisheth salvation, that saith unto Zion, Thy God read Nath. Thy watchmen shall lift up the voice, with the voice together shall they sing, for they shall see eye to eye, when the Lord shall bring again Zion. Break forth into joy, sing together, ye waste places of Jerusalem, for the Lord hath comforted his people, he hath redeemed Jerusalem. The Lord hath made bare his holy arm in the eyes of all the nations, and all the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of our God. Depart ye, depart ye, go ye out from thence, touch no unclean thing, go ye out of the midst of her, be ye clean, that bear the vessels of the Lord. For ye shall not go out with haste, nor go by flight, for the Lord will go before you, and the God of Israel will be your rearward. Hosea 10 verse 1 Israel is an empty vine, he bringeth forth fruit unto himself, according to the multitude of his fruit he hath increased the altars, according to the goodness of his land they have made goodly images. Revelation 21 verse 7 He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. Chapter 7 Godly Sorrow Worketh Repentance 2 Corinthians 7 verse 1 Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Having therefore these promises, the promises of God's being a Father unto us. 2 Corinthians 7 verses 2 to 3 Receive us. We have wronged no man, we have corrupted no man, we have defrauded no man. I speak not this to condemn you, for I have said before, that ye are in our hearts to die and live with you. 2 Corinthians 6 verse 11 O ye Corinthians, our mouth is open unto you, our heart is enlarged. Paul had given his all for this church, and he would even die in service to them. He wanted them to know of his love and concern for them was just as parents would be for their children. 2 Corinthians 7 verses 4 to 5 Great is my boldness of speech toward you, great is my glorying of you, I am filled with comfort, I am exceeding joyful in all our tribulation. 4. When we were come into Macedonia, our flesh had no rest, but we were troubled on every side, without were fightings, within were fears. Paul had the concern not only of the churches, but of his companions for their safety and effectiveness in proclaiming God's word because there was opposition from within, the churches, and from without. 2 Corinthians 7 verses 6 to 7 Nevertheless God, that comforteth those that are cast down, comforted us by the coming of Titus, and not by his coming only, but by the consolation wherewith he was comforted in you, when he told us your earnest desire, your mourning, your fervent mind toward me, so that I rejoice the more. The consolation wherewith he was comforted in you, Paul tells the Corinthians that after his first letter he had worried how some of them would respond. When Titus had come, he told Paul how many of the Corinthians had sorrowed to repentance, and that made him and his companions rejoice. 2 Corinthians 7 verses 8 to 10 For though I made you sorry with a letter, I do not repent, though I did repent, for I perceive that the same epistle hath made you sorry, though it were but for a season. Now I rejoice, not that ye were made sorry, but that ye sorrowed to repentance, for ye were made sorry after a godly manner, that ye might receive damage by us in nothing. For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. Paul rejoiced that the first epistle brought about godly sorrow over their own sin and then the needed repentance. The man who was living in open sin with his stepmother was disciplined at the instruction of the apostle to them and they felt sorrow that their inaction may have caused Paul grief. 
Godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, the man later repented, and Paul instructed them to receive him back into their fellowship unless he would be overtaken in grief. The sorrow of the world is a sorrow that they were caught, but godly sorrow is a sorrow is the realization that one has grieved God and others, and it is one that leads to repentance and the forsaking of such actions in the future. 2 Corinthians 7 verse 11 For behold this selfsame thing, that ye sorrowed after a godly sort, what carefulness it wrought in you, yeah, what clearing of yourselves, yeah, what indignation, yeah, what fear, yeah, what vehement desire, yeah, what zeal, yeah, what revenge. In all things ye have approved yourselves to be clear in this matter. Paul wanted the Corinthians to know that they did the right things in this matter, and God's word did its work in this man's life. They did not allow Satan to get a foothold in the church regarding the subject, which he would have if Paul hadn't addressed it out of love for them. 2 Corinthians 7 verses 12 to 13 Wherefore, though I wrote unto you, I did it not for his cause that had done the wrong, nor for his cause that suffered wrong, but that our care for you in the sight of God might appear unto you. Therefore, we were comforted in your comfort, yea, and exceedingly the more joyed we for the joy of Titus, because his spirit was refreshed by you all. Paul wanted those that they cared for to know that they had their best interests at heart and when Titus returned and told Paul of the Corinthians' response, he was overwhelmed with much joy. 2 Corinthians 7 verses 14 to 16 For if I have boasted anything to him of you, I am not ashamed, but as we spake all things to you in truth, even so our boasting, which I made before Titus, is found a truth. And his inward affection is more abundant toward you, whilst he remembereth the obedience of you all, how with fear and trembling ye received him. I rejoice therefore that I have confidence in you in all things. Paul's confidence in the Corinthians was so strengthened by the report he received back from Titus that he could now say he had confidence in the Corinthians in all things. They truly were making a turnaround in the church, and it was evident to Titus and now to Paul. Chapter 8 Grace Purpose Giving 2 Corinthians 8 verses 1 to 2 Moreover, brethren, we do to wit of the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia, how that in a great trial of affliction the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded unto the riches of their liberality. We do you to wit, to know. Paul reminded the rich Corinthians that the churches of Macedonia were giving liberally to the poor saints back in Jerusalem even though they were under severe persecution. Paul says that they gave joyfully even though they were in deep poverty. God loves a cheerful giver. The grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia. They knew what it meant to be persecuted and their hearts and wallets were knit together with the saints there. Macedonia is the place that God called Paul to come and minister when he wanted to head east into Asia, but God wanted Europe to hear the gospel first. 2 Corinthians 8 verses 3 to 4 For to their power, I bear record, yea, and beyond their power they were willing of themselves, praying us with much entreaty that we would receive the gift and take upon us the fellowship of the ministering to the saints. To their power, their ability to give was increased by God because of their joy in doing so. They had to plead with Paul and his companions to take their offering and to give it to those suffering saints in Jerusalem. Paul wanted to let these saints in Macedonia get out of their promise to help the church in Jerusalem because they had not foreseen the trouble that would befall them soon after they had originally promised to send relief. They kept their commitment, and Paul was hoping their testimony would help the Corinthians to keep theirs. The Corinthians were not suffering like those of Macedonia, in fact Corinth was flourishing. 2 Corinthians 8 verses 5 to 6 And this they did, not as we hoped, but first gave their own selves to the Lord, and unto us by the will of God. Insomuch that we desired Titus, that as he had begun, so he would also finish in you the same grace also. Titus was initially used a year earlier in making the plight of the church in Jerusalem known throughout the churches in this region. It would be he, along with others, that would return at the end of the year on the first day of the week, Sunday, to gather up the offerings for the saints. 2 Corinthians 8 verses 7 to 8 Therefore, as ye abound in everything, 
in faith and utterance and knowledge and in all diligence and in your love to us, see that ye abound in this grace also. I speak not by commandment, but by occasion of the forwardness of others and to prove the sincerity of your love. Paul tells the Corinthians to abound in their giving as they have received bountifully from the Lord in so many other areas, including their finances. Paul said others made a commitment out of love and later proved they meant what they said, and he was encouraging these saints to do the same as the poor saints in Macedonia. Giving money does not prove that you are spiritual, but hoarding it proves the opposite. 2 Corinthians 8 verses 9 to 10 For ye know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that, though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that ye through his poverty might be rich. And herein I give my advice, for this is expedient for you, who have begun before, not only to do, but also to be forward a year ago. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, he gave his life for us. One year ago, the church under Paul's leadership determined to send relief to the church in Jerusalem. Paul reminds the rich Corinthians that Christ was also rich, and he became poor so that they might become spiritually rich. Paul wanted the church in Corinth to honor their previous commitment. They had much, and Paul wanted them to be Christ-like in their actions and make some poor people rich by them sending relief to the church in Jerusalem. The saints in Jerusalem would have a hard time ministering to the saints there and reaching out to any new ones if others would not help. 2 Corinthians 8 verses 11 to 12 Now therefore perform the doing of it, that as there was a readiness to will, so there may be a performance also out of that which ye have. For if there be first a willing mind, it is accepted according to that a man hath, and not according to that he hath not. Out of that which ye have, we are not to make promises out of that which we do not have. Paul tells the Corinthians to give out of what they have, not out of what they don't have. Give what you are willing to give out of love in the area of missions. 2 Corinthians 8 verses 13 to 15 For I mean not that other men be eased, and ye burdened, but by an equality, that now at this time your abundance may be a supply for their want, that their abundance also may be a supply for your want, that there may be equality, as it is written, He that had gathered much had nothing over, and he that had gathered little had no lack. Exodus 16 verse 18 And when they did meet it with an omer, he that gathered much had nothing over, and he that gathered little had no lack, they gathered every man according to his eating. Paul assures the rich Corinthians that he is not trying to put the entire burden on them alone. He reminds them that each should give according as God has blessed them. The shoe will one day be on the other foot and the Corinthians will be in need and other churches that are abounding then will then give to help the church there. The church in Jerusalem, after receiving a gift from the churches amongst the Gentiles would be knit together with those that had given to them and would naturally want to give when they could to help those who had helped them. 2 Corinthians 8 verses 16 to 18 But thanks be to God, which put the same earnest care into the heart of Titus for you. For indeed he accepted the exhortation, but being more forward, of his own accord he went unto you. And we have sent with him the brother, whose praise is in the gospel throughout all the churches. God had put into Titus' heart a desire to help the Corinthians in such a way that was evident to all just as God has gifted each of us with some gift. 2 Corinthians 8 verses 19 to 21 And not that only, but who was also chosen of the churches to travel with us with this grace, which is administered by us to the glory of the same Lord, and declaration of your ready mind, avoiding this, that no man should blame us in this abundance which is administered by us, providing for honest things, not only in the sight of the Lord, but also in the sight of men. This grace, it was imperative that the grace, bounty or offering that was bestowed upon the church in Jerusalem arrive unmolested. With churches supplying large offerings it was necessary that many accompany the offering. Providing for honest things, they were abstaining from the appearance of covetousness by having others involved in watching over the financial gift as stewards. 2 Corinthians 8 verses 22 to 24 And we have sent with them our brother, whom we have oftentimes proved diligent in many things, but now much more diligent upon the great confidence which I have in you. 
Whether any do inquire of Titus, he is my partner and fellow helper concerning you, or our brethren be inquired of, they are the messengers of the churches, and the glory of Christ. Wherefore shew ye to them, and before the churches, the proof of your love, and of our boasting on your behalf. The proof of your love, the money they had taken up. Then the necessary preparations could be made for both the gathering to be ready, and a place of rest and refreshment could be prepared for the wayfaring strangers before they headed on to Jerusalem.